salt. You know, we are completely drowning in it. Most of us are, and we are completely unaware that that is the case. And man, when that sodium bomb goes off, it can be disaster for your heart. It can be disaster for your kidneys. It can just be plain disaster. But the conundrum here is that we also need salt 100% to survive. So how much is too much and how little is too little? And what kind of salt should we be eating, if any? We're going to find out today. Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hello, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for raising your health IQ with us in more than 150 countries around the world and making the exam room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And our guest today is a doctor who takes a nutrition first approach. He has spent years counseling his patients on ways to fine tune their diet to get their blood pressure under control, get their heart in better shape and get their bodies to work for them instead of against them. He's also the medical director at the Barnard Medical Center and a featured speaker at the upcoming International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine in Washington, D.C., plus one half of the brand new nutrition series, The Doc and Chef. Dr. Jim Loomis is here with us today, and if there's a question you have for Dr. Loomis about salts or anything else, drop it in the doctor's mailbag by posting it in the comments or in the chat, and we're going to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can here on the program today. And with that, let's just dive right in and talk some salt with my man, Dr. Jim Loomis. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Chuck. All right, Dr. Loomis. We talked uh, at the top here, we, we mentioned heart disease, we mentioned stroke. Uh, I believe kidney issues can come from eating too much sodium. What other health challenges can a really salt-heavy diet present? Well, the main ones are blood pressure and stroke. Although, again, as you mentioned, it has been associated with an increased risk for, for um, heart disease as well. One thing people don't realize, uh, another big risk of overconsumption of salt is actually osteoporosis is another complication from the overconsumption of salt. Uh, osteoporosis. So what, what are we talking there? Like it actually leaches calcium out of the bones? How does that work? It does. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, it, it causes the bones to become weak. And when, when people have osteoporosis, they're much more... High, much higher risk for developing fractures. You know, you slip on the ice or you might bruise your hip. Now you're, you know, you, you've broken it or you've broken your wrist. So um, uh, a lot of people don't realize that salt is, overconsumption of salt is a major risk factor for osteoporosis. All right. So we know that we need salt to survive. We also know that most of us are eating way too much of it. What is the sweet spot for salt, man? Well, um, you know, studies show we do need salt, as you said. We need salt for healthy muscle function. Um, it, it's important to maintain the proper mineral balance in our blood. Uh, it also is important for nerve function. But but actually, we only need about 500 milligrams of sodium a day to, to meet that kind of base, those base requirements for sodium. Average American gets 3,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Um, most, most health organizations recommend that you limit your salt intake to no more than about 2000, somewhere around 2000. Although if you've got problems like high blood pressure, really that keeping it less than 1500 milligrams is, is probably important. But, but again, you know, there's a huge swing between that sweet spot, as you say, which is, you know, certainly less than 2000, probably in the thousand to 1500 milligram range, ideally to that 3,500 milligrams that most people get every day. All right. So let's talk about this, man. You go to the grocery store, you go down the spice aisle and you see 18 gajillion different types of salt. Let's take a question from Shani. I wonder if that's Mike Shanahan. Uh, Shani is wondering what the difference is between sea salt and regular salt in terms of health. So that's an important question. So we're talking about salt here, but what we should really be talking about is sodium, right? Because it's sodium that I should have clarified that early on. So it's sodium that we have to be concerned about. So it's not salt. The salt intake is not 3,500 milligrams that we take in. It's sodium. And so most salt is, is about 60%, uh, uh, it's about 40% sodium, 60% chloride. It's, it's sodium chloride. There's, there's a slight differences in depending on the kind of salt. So, so functionally, um, salt is salt, right? Now, some salts may have a little bit more, a little bit less sodium, but salt is salt. So there's really no health benefits, if you will, of using sea salt versus, you know, pink Himalayan salt versus this table salt. Um, th the one thing to take note of is, though, is that um, another, uh, another um, mineral that we need 
for, for proper thyroid function is iodine. Most table saw today is iodinized. So if you look at Morton's table saw, it'll say iodinized on it. And we need iodine for, again, for proper thyroid function. Um, many people, when they, um, when they switch to a healthier diet, we perceive that the sea salt or pig Himalayan salt is healthier. So, so we stop using the table salt. And so we kind of lose that source of iodine. So it is important that this is just an aside. Uh, it is important if you're not using iodinized salt uh, that you have a source of, of iodine, you know, something like kiwi or kelp or something like that. You can, you know, you can uh, crumble up dulce or nori in your food. Um, but um, most of the salt we get, though, isn't from the salt shaker. Um, about 60, 70 percent of the salt that most people consume comes from processed and restaurant foods, actually. Mm. Yeah, I wonder what would happen if they put the sodium content on their menus like <laughs> some do now with the with the calories. Um, I, I wonder, though, you know what? Let's take a question from Billy. Go back to the different salt varieties. We were yeah. talking about uh, the difference between sea salt and regular salt and, and now iodized salt. But, you know, do all of them raise blood pressure equally? Are they all the same in terms of what that's going to do to you? It is. So, so again, it's, it's, it's all about the sodium content. So we know that a sodium intake above that kind of 2000 at the top, uh, it can raise your blood pressure. So the thing is, um, I, I use a little salt um, in my cooking. Is it like I use it to finish? Uh, you know, Chef uh, Karen, the chef in Dock and Chef, puts a little salt in her food. In fact, we have a, we have a Dock and Chef episode that talks specifically about that. Um, you know, the, the using table salt, the really fine grain salt, is, is very difficult to manipulate from a culinary standpoint. So the heavier grain salt, like kosher salt or sea salt, is, is what I use typically when I'm using um, um, uh, when I use it as a finishing salt. Um, so, so a little bit of salt is fine. And again, back to the iodine question, if you want to get your, your salt from, from table salt, that's fine. But three quarters of a teaspoon of salt, that's how much is in, is provides that 150 micro, micrograms of iodine. That is also around 2000 milligrams of sodium. So a little bit of salt goes a long way is, is the point, whether it be the kosher salt, the, the pink Himalayan salt, the sea salt, or table salt. Um, um, a little bit of salt goes a long way. So that's why, you, you know, you, 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 cause you know, you see people all the time, you, you get your dish and what's the first, before you even taste it, what's the first thing they reach for is a salt shaker, right? Even at a restaurant, which is already loaded with salt. So, you know, our, our, our bodies have, we kind of developed this taste for salt. And what, what's interesting about that is I know when I first, you know, transitioned to a plant-based diet, a healthier diet and really cut back on my salt, I really, you know, food tasted really bland at first, but, but after a week or so, my tongue and my, my, my brain got readjusted to that. So now if I, if I go out and I have a, a dish that's over salted, man, I can really taste it. It's, uh, you know, I'm, you become much more sensitive to salt, the less salt that you, that you, that you use. Uh, you know, think, back in my old days, man, I would say I was definitely hooked on salt. That was a big part of what made up my issues as a food addict. But you just said, like, your taste buds change. You know, what's the difference between being hooked on salt, as some of us are, and then just being able to, after a week, essentially get our taste buds to change and then we can move on? So skirt the difference for us there. Well, I don't, I don't know that, you know, when we're hooked on salt, that implies some type of an addiction. And, you know, there's some, there's some specific definitions of addiction that we go out our way to seek it and we withdraw from it when we, when we don't have it. I don't know of any research to suggest that, that salt is, um, is truly addictive, but our brains can, you know, can, can get used to highly salted foods. You know, it, again, it's one of the things that makes food hyper palatable um, is, salt, right? Salt, fat, and sugar are, are the three. And so, um, you know, and so the other thing that's hard to tease out is a lot of many of the foods, like the foods you used to eat, Chuck, in the old days, you know, they're not, they're not only loaded with salt, but they're also loaded with sugar and fat. And we know that sugar, for example, does have some addictive quality. So, you know, when you're craving some of those foods, is it really the salt or is it the sugar? Um, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to tease that out. Uh, but, you know, so I, I think craving salt and being addicted to salt are kind of two different things. And, you know, I think there's some crossover between, again, because the foods that typically have a ton of salt, these, these ultra hyper palatable, ultra processed foods um, tend to have a lot of these other things, which, in fact, can be addicting like sugar. 
All right. Uh, I want to actually play a clip from the Doc and Chef. Uh, you did a whole episode devoted to salt recently. I want to play that in just a second. But first, I want to take a question from Sharon that came in at 12.05. A lot of us, you know, we think like if we eat something that's super salty, we can just drink a lot of water and that'll flush this out of the system. But Sharon says, can that actually do that? I ate a pizza slice and my ankle swelled up, but then I did drink some water and it went down a lot. Uh, and then by the next morning, everything was back to normal. So how quick Quickly, can we flush this out of our system if we eat a sodium bomb and then just chug a whole bunch of water behind it? Yeah, I mean, that will help flush it out. But here's the problem. Um, so so when we increase the sodium concentration in, in our blood, so salt is osmotic. So it draws water in. Right. So that's why when we when we eat a lot of salt, we, we get thirsty because that that salt is is drawing water into tissue and drawing water into our bloodstream. And so that, that triggers our, our thirst. And the problem is um, when we, when we expand when we increase the volume of blood in our blood, in a water, if you will, or plasma in, in our blood vessels, that's actually what causes the blood pressure to go up. Right. So, so yeah, you can flush the salt out with water, but, but still in, in, between, between the time you, you drink that, that's, you know, those, eat those salty foods, you drink the water, the swelling goes down, you know, you run the risk of, of spiking your blood pressure in that interim. And that's what we don't want to do. Because again, you know, we know that high blood pressures increase your risk for heart failure and, and for strokes and for kidney problems and, and, and all kinds of other things you really don't want to have. All right. I really love what it is that you're doing with Karen Dugan, uh, one of our Food for Life instructors who runs the Center for Plant-Based Living out in the St. Louis area, and that is the Doc and Chef Project. I put together a little clip from one of your recent episodes on salt that kind of shows what Doc and Chef is all about. I love the way that you're kind of marrying your nutrition and your medical knowledge with Karen's recipes for health right there in one nutritious punch. So if we could roll that, that would be fantastic. An interesting, just by the way, an interesting rule of thumb is um, we need about as many calories per day as we need milligrams of sodium. Is that right? But we, most people get about 1,800, 2,000 milligrams of sodium. I mean, of calories, that's what we need. That's about how many milligrams of sodium. So if you look at the label uh -huh. and the calorie count, and in this case it's 200, right. is less than the sodium intake, in uh -huh. this case 850, you probably should put it back on the shelf. I have a couple of favorite snacks, but one that I find myself eating a lot of is popcorn. Right. So let me show you how I like to flavor up popcorn with hardly adding any salt. You know, get in there, toss it around. You know, you can hear it. How do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to add in, this is uh, nutritional yeast. Yeah. So it's a deactivated yeast that, that tastes very cheesy so we're gonna have some cheesy popcorn yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I know some just... people make like a parmesan out of it and, yeah. and it gives it that kind of umami taste right right that cheesy flavor that's yeah, right it's brilliant and then garlic because we like garlic right, right? right yeah but you could really put anything on anything it, right? if you, you, you want to put your pepper cumin indian i mean you, you can bet. put anything right yeah you know, I, I love the Doc and Chef show. You guys, it's such fun, interesting facts that pop up on the screen all the time. But then Karen coming right behind with this, you know, really uh, low salt popcorn recipe. And um, she she likes plain popcorn, if I'm not mistaken. But her secret ingredient there was actually pickle juice. So you saw the nutritional yeast and you saw the garlic powder. But what she didn't see was what she was spraying in that bottle was actually just a little pinch of right. pickle juice. I mean, you tasted the popcorn. How was that? It was, it was amazing. And, you know, people say, well, what about pickle juice has a lot of salt? Well, we, we actually did the calculation. Uh, the amount of pickle, the amount of sodium that we actually, that she actually sprayed on that popcorn was like, five milligrams or something like that. I mean, really minuscule because it's so diluted. I mean, literally it was just a few spritzes. And so, and, and you're right. I think what I love about Doc and Chef and, and what our goal was, you know, Karen and I were getting the same questions. You know, what about salt? Uh, what, what about soy? What about protein? Um, and, and so we decided, hey, why don't we put together a, a, a YouTube channel where we answer these questions, dispel some of this mythology around food and marry that nutrition science and then translate, you know, to your plate of food. So translate the science to your plate of food. And it's been, it's been, uh, it's been, um, it's been great fun. And again, the salt episode, um, um, you know, I mean, all of them are really informative. And, and um, um, so if you're not, if you haven't subscribed, go take a look at it today. Um, they come out every two weeks and uh, it's really been a fun project.
Yeah, we've got links to the YouTube channel right now, so you can go ahead, click over there, hit that subscribe button, give it a follow there. Also, Instagram, um, and just s such a such a cool concept. So I'm I'm so glad that I can kind of help you guys behind the scenes a little bit as you grow that. Um, and we do film everything at the Center for Plant Based Living out in St. Louis, which is just an extraordinary uh, an extraordinary place for health. I always love. It just blows me away because. Like this place is right across the street from one bar and to the left you have a chicken place and to the left of that you have another bar and then right here though is the center for health and people poke their head in because they're curious. I don't know if they're feeling guilty about going to eat some fried chicken or what the deal is, but they're definitely veg curious. And then Karen brings them in and uh, converts them into members and you guys together really take their health to the next level. And they probably may yep. not have even been thinking about that that day, but they see what's going on. They're like, I got to get that's in exactly on right. That's exactly right. Karen has a membership program where I actually write, literally write prescriptions for a membership to the Center for Plant Page Living in lieu of like metformin for diabetes, right? So that's pretty remarkable that, I mean, food is medicine and people, you know, people, you know, when, when the, what we're really trying to promote is culinary literacy to some degree, when, when the average person can boil water and heat stuff up in the microwave, you know, and un heat a pizza up in the oven, you know, that's probably not, those are not the culinary skills that are gonna get you to a healthier place. And so the goal here is to really teach people not only you know, why you should be eating certain foods. Why, why is it that restricting your salt intake, watching your fat intake, increasing the amount of fiber in your diet, um, you know, that it's okay to eat soy, not only teaching people why and how these things are important, but again, how do you translate that to your plate? We're using recipes that are, that are, that are simple, relatively simple and easy and tasty and on and on and on. So yeah, it's, it's great. And specific to salt, I mean, I really do hold true that the majority of us, until we start taking a closer look at our health, have no idea how much salt we're actually eating. Um, do you guys actually find it challenging to help people as they begin their quest for health to get them to cut a lot of sodium out of this? Or do people get pretty excited with what it is you guys are cooking up that, oh my gosh, like this tastes amazing. And it has like a quarter or less of the sodium that I had been eating before. That's, you know, that, that's exactly right, Chuck, because I think the thing is when, when people are starting out on a journey, you know, of a, on a plant-based diet, when you can teach them and to, to eat and then to serve to their families and friends, you know, healthy, tasty food that we don't have to worry about adding up how much sodium or having to worry up, you know, am I getting enough fiber or am I getting enough protein or, you know, is there too much fat? When we teach people how to, to eat healthy like this, honestly, you don't really need to worry about it. And, you know, there are some simple tricks like the one we, you showed in the clip where, you know, if the, if the calories on the, on the food label, if the sodium content on the food label is greater than the calories, then you should probably put it back. Uh, just because, um, just because, um, you know, it's got too much sodium. Um, I, I think a lot of people, when they start learning how to cook healthy, they don't go to the restaurants as much so that, that, and they're making healthier choices at the restaurant. Um, so they're not getting all that sodium intake. So, so again, I, I think the beauty of this is, is that, that when we adapt to healthier plant-based uh, cooking style, you know, the stuff that Karen teaches, you know, everything gets better. Your fiber intake goes up, your protein intake is adequate, your fat intake goes down, your salt intake goes down. Um, and, and I think that's the beauty of the whole thing, really. All right. We're going to talk more about salt here in just a little bit. So keep your questions coming. Let's fill up that doctor's mailbag. Post your questions for Dr. Loomis in the comments or in the chat. We're going to get to as many as we can with the time that we have left here on the show today. Uh, by the way, right now, uh, Center for Plant-Based Living, Karen, uh, you know, the classes with this uh, amazing, by the way, cancer survivor. I mean, the reason that she does this is very personal. Um, the classes right now, the membership at the Center for Plant-Based Living, uh, half off right now for exam room viewers and listeners. So all of you exam roomies who are interested, use code 50 off 50 OFF when signing up for the monthly membership. Uh, we've got a link to do that right now in the episode notes or in the show description, or you can visit cpbl stl. Dot com. All right. Uh, next question here. Uh, we're still looking for, you know, more clarity, Dr. Loomis, on all of these different kinds of salt, because I'm telling you, man, 
like people have this perception and maybe most of this is marketing that pink sea salt or himalayan salt is healthier than table salt or then we've got black salt we've got salt from here salt from there salt from all over the world and some inevitably must be healthier than others or so the marketing says are they really like all the same just different colors marketed under different names are there any nutritional differences oh. There are some subtle nutritional differences that mainly have to do with what, what other minerals are in there. So, you know, if, if you're making sea salt off the coast of France versus the, you know, sea salt, in, you know, in, in England uh, versus pink Himalayan salt from, from, from Northern India um, um, or black salt, you know, which is a volcanic salt. So, so there are some subtle taste differences and some subtle differences in minerals that are available, but that's what drives the taste, but not, any it, not as far as i know any solid research to show that one salt one one type of salt is healthier or you know less healthful or more healthy than the other and it's really just again the the, the health de the detriments from salt come from sodium and so it doesn't matter where the sodium what what type of salt that sodium is coming from so you know i i do use again i use different kinds of salt depending on what what i'm cooking and how i want to finish it and you know different size grains and different colors and different tastes but but from a health standpoint there's probably no health advantage from using say pink himalayan salt versus you know uh, french sea salt versus uh you know black salt from hawaii or 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 whatever um you know from a culinary standpoint pan point there's an interesting salt that i use black salt uh, which is a volcanic salt from used in indian cuisine and it's got a sulfurous taste so uh, many people who follow plant-based diet will use black salt it's also called kala namak they'll, they'll use that um, if you're if you're looking to make say a tofu scramble and you want to make that kind of eggy you want that kind of eggy taste or say you're making a, a vegan mayo with some silken tofu um, um, you can use black salt to give it the flavor. But again, the sodium is the sodium is the sodium. So it really doesn't matter. All right. But when uh, when somebody wants to take salt out of their diet and the sodium is not the sodium is not the sodium anymore because they're using a salt substitute, what should they be turning to? Meg says she actually is using a salt substitute. I assume, Dr. Loomis, it's one that she's able to find in the store. Meg at 1204 is wondering whether that is OK. It is. There are there are a number of, of salt substitutes, you know, Mrs. Dashes and things like that. And, and um, there's a variety. I tell you, though, um, what you know, once you get comfortable with with other kinds of spices and herbs and spices in your food, you know, then, then I guarantee you won't miss the salt. There, there are a few things, though, you can use to kind of brighten up your dishes um, um, in, in lieu of salt. So citrus is, is one, um, you know, adding a, a little squeeze of lemon or lime uh, to a salad or salad dressing or a soup or a stew that can really brighten that dish up in a way with, without the salt. Uh, vinegars too, like balsamic vinegars, you can use flavored balsamic vinegars, white vinegar. That's another way to, to, to you know, that, that, that little bit of acid uh, can kind of take the place of salt. So there's lots of other ways to, to, um, 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 get that flavor you want without using salt. But, uh, you know, some of the salt substitutes, some of them have pot a, a potassium salt in there. So instead of sodium chloride, it's potassium chloride. Nothing wrong with that as long as you don't have a chronic kidney problem. So people with, with chronic kidney disease have to be careful about their, their potassium intake. We have a lot of roomies right now who are watching Dr. Loomis who are just trapped in this ultra heat wave. Our friend Tofu Tuesday out in the Arizona area has been dealing with triple digits seemingly forever and a day now. And so that kind of brings an interesting question to the table from Marianne at 1222, who's wondering, because of the excess heat, should we have a certain amount of sodium to help retain some of the water? So as long as you're getting that healthy, you know, between 1500 and 20, you know, 2300 or somewhere in there, uh, th that's going to be more than enough sodium. Now, now that being said, um, so, so, so it's a couple of quick comments about that. Um, so when we sweat, we can actually lose electrolytes, salt and, and sodium and other electrolytes. And so if you're out working in this hundred degree weather, it is important to take an electrolyte solution, not so much for the sodium, but, but all the other nutrients, the, the electrolytes you, 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 you can, you, you know, you need. 
Now, you can also get in trouble on the other end of things. Um, if you drink too much water, it can actually dilute the sodium in your in your blood and your sodium level can drop low and that can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, there's been situations where people say, for example, running a marathon and they're and they're drinking tons and tons and tons and tons of water without electrolytes, without a little salt and potassium and, and such in, in that solution um, where, where it's, you know, cause irregular heart rhythms and things like that. So, you know, it is important to, to stay hydrated. Um, you know, a rough rule of thumb when I talk to patients is that, you know, if, if you're, if you're trying to rehydrate after you've been sweating a ton, you know, you're, you're out stuck outside in, in this heat wave, um, you can weigh yourself before and after. And uh, a rough rule of thumb is a liter of water weighs a kilogram and a kilogram is about two, 2.2 pounds. So every two pounds you lose on a hot summer day is a liter of water you need to put back. Um, sometimes, you know, you can lose, you know, I remember I was training for Ironman a few years ago and, and you know, I had a hundred mile bike ride on, on a day like today here in Washington, D.C., where hot and humid, heat index in the hundreds. I, I lost, um, I, I, I drank five liters of water and was still down two at the end of my training ride. Uh, so, so you can lose it. You know, when you're, when you, if you're efficient and sweating, you can lose a lot, a lot of fluids. So say you're down four pounds and you need to put back two liters of water. The first liter should have some electrolytes. You know, I use things like coconut water or, or, or something like that, but after that, it probably doesn't matter. So it is important to have some electrolytes initially, probably for the first liter you need to replenish. But after that, uh, water's fine. All right, one of your fellow athletes is in the chat right now, uh, Lily Tiala, triple seven at twelve o four. She says, "Please don't break my heart. I love my salt. I'm a runner, and I have low blood pressure, though. So hopefully, she's saying that gives me a pass to use four thousand milligrams a day or a little bit more. Uh, is that a little bit excessive, or is that basically? And we're, we can't speak specifically for her, but by and large, if somebody's training every day, how do their sodium requirements?" compared to the average person yeah so so what, what's interesting about that is is that um when you as you as you uh get into better shape we actually become more efficient our sweat glands will actually hold on to salt much more efficiently um as we get into better shape we, we sweat more efficiently and and if and, and so it, and I've noticed it. So when spring comes around and I'm starting to really get back out there and sweat and get going, you know, I take off my hat and I've got a white band of sodium around it. Right. Well, a month later, two months later, when I'm doing those same kind of workouts on a hot summer day, I'm sweating a lot more. But but, this, you know, the, my sweat doesn't taste salty. So your body does a really good job of, of kind of holding on to salt when we need to. Right. And, and so, you know, four thousand is probably a lot. Now, if you know, if you're if you're young and healthy and you've got a relatively low blood pressure, you've got good kidneys, probably not going to have a huge adverse consequence, although I would be a little bit concerned about osteoporosis risk over the long run. But um, and there are some people that have some specific medical conditions uh, where they have a hard time, you know, where their blood pressure drops when they stand up. And in those patients, sometimes, you know, we do recommend a little extra salt. Um, uh, but for most people, 4000 is, is, is too much. Uh, Matthew Dixon kind of channeling his uh, inner Seinfeld here <laughs> says miso is salty, but some reports suggest it's not a problem in the same way as salt. What's the deal with miso? Are yeah. there any other salty products that are okay, like MSG, soy sauce, aminos, etc.? What can you say to that? Well, so it's all it's all in the in the context of how much salt are you getting, right? So you know, a serving of miso is what maybe a teaspoon, tablespoon. So yeah, there's some salt in it, but it's not a ton. And and if if that's your primary source of salt, then you're probably going to be okay. One one interesting thing though, um, particularly around blood pressure, we we talk a lot about salt, but it turns out it's probably from a blood pressure standpoint the ratio of potassium to sodium, which is much more important. And some of these foods actually also have potassium. So really what you're looking for is a ratio of about 40, about three to one. So say, say you're trying to restrict your salt intake to 1500 milligrams, that's about 4,500 milligrams of potassium. What's interesting, and there was a study done in, in Korean women who had a, a pretty high salt intake because they were eating a lot of kimchi and kimchi, you know, has a lot of salt, but the cabbage and such is in the kimchi also has a ton of potassium in it. So, so the kimchi had a, a so potassium to sodium ratio of greater than three to one. Um, and they didn't have issues with their blood pressure despite consuming more salt. So 
you know, theoretically, you can you can cheat a little bit on the on the sodium if you're getting enough potassium. Now, most people when they think about potassium when you're getting a ton of potassium. Most people think about potassium, they think about bananas. So bananas have about 400 milligrams per day. Uh, so you'd have to eat 10 or 12 bananas a day to get that amount of potassium. A cup of beet greens, 1,300 milligrams. A cup of Swiss chard, spinach, 1,000 milligrams. A cup of sweet potatoes, potatoes, 1,000 milligrams. So, so, so you know, eating these green leafy vegetables and such is, is an important way to kind of help mitigate some of the effects of salt. But again, back to the original question about soy sauce and misos. Uh, miso. There is salt, but again, the kind of servings that we typically see um, in the context of an overall healthy diet aren't going to be enough to really drive your sodium intake through the roof unless you're using you know, a lot of table salt and are eating he heavily salted restaurant foods and things like that. Jana at 1217 is kind of wondering the same thing along the lines you were just talking about with the kimchi uh, in terms of sauerkraut. Same kind of deal there? Yeah, same thing. Um, and you know, you mentioned potassium uh, being in, in the whole food there, being the banana. I'm curious, like, are there any whole foods, some fruits and vegetables that are kind of like sneakily sodium bombs? Like, is that ever going to be a concern? What are some high sodium natural foods? Well, like celery, for example, has a fair amount of potassium. But when I say a fair amount, it's like, you know, 30 milligrams or something like that. So so there are really no naturally occurring foods that are that are that are, that they have a little sodium, but not enough to really be of, of a concern. You have to worry about over consuming. Now I imagine if you juice 10 pounds of celery and, and drank that, that, you know, that might be an issue, but pe people don't do that. So there, so to answer your question, Chuck, there's really no foods that are, that are, have a, a, a enough sodium naturally in them to cause any kind of concern with regards to your health. That's interesting. All right. Something then definitely to keep in mind. And then I want to ask you this flat out because I know that there are a number of exam roomies who are watching or listening to this right now who eat an SOS free diet, a salt, oil, and sugar free diet. So if somebody is completely eliminating added sodium to mm -hmm. their diet, I mean, are they running any sort of risk there? Do you recommend adding a pinch? Can you do it safely and not run any risk? Talk you to can. Us about yeah, because like I said, the, the amount of sodium we eat we actually need is, is not very much. So people talk about 500, some evidence it might be as low as 200, 250. And most of the, you know, most of our food has a little bit of sodium in it. So again, if you're eating a well-rounded whole food plant-based diet, there's probably enough naturally occurring sodium in, in that food to meet your minimum sodium requirements. So, so, you know, it, it would be, it would be impossible to design a completely sodium free diet, uh, because again, there is sodium that naturally occurs in some foods. And, and, and um, um, so, so it, it, I don't think it's anything to worry about as long, again, as long as you're eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet, if you're only eating, you know, one food, you know, some kind of extreme form of, of, a, of a diet, you might run into trouble, but if you're eating a well-balanced whole food plant-based diet, I, I don't think it's any, any concern. I've never, I've never seen a patient I have a lot of lots and lots of patients who follow SS, SOS free diet. I've never seen anybody get into trouble with not getting enough sodium kind of naturally in their diet. Uh, how about this? Uh, Greg from St. Louis has on his chef's hat today. He says, I've substituted turmeric, ginger, and cinnamon for salt. He says he loves the taste and it doesn't give the, however, it doesn't give the savoriness that he craves. Um, that does sound delicious, though, man. I mean, the turmeric, yeah. ginger, and cinnamon blend. I Not exactly salt, but, man, that, that might hit the yeah. spot nonetheless. Yeah. And, you know, garlic, there's a lot of herb, herb, uh, herb and spice um, um, uh, combinations you can use to give you that flavor. And, and by the way, that, you know, that particular combination of spices is also probably one of the most highly anti-inflammatory spice blends you can you can consume. And, and I actually... Put that in my recovery shake that I used when I was training for our man. And even today, when I go out for a really hard workout or long ride, uh, I actually added cinnamon, tumor, and ginger, ginger to my uh, recovery shake uh, for, for that for those anti-inflammatory properties. So again, that's the beauty of, of using whole foods or, or foods derived from whole foods, like you know cinnamon and, and, and herbs and spices, because not only do they give us those flavor bombs, but they also individually have tremendous health benefits. I mean, cinnamon is highly anti-inflammatory. It's actually an excellent source of calcium. Um, you know, turmeric, the curcumin that's in the turmeric 
incredibly uh, anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory. You know, ginger can help with our digestion. It you know, helps prevent nausea. It, it's a highly anti-inflammatory, so on and on and on. So, so again, that's, a, you know, as opposed to salt, which is just a flavor, when, we, when we're using herbs and spices to, to, to flavor our foods, not only getting those wonderful flavors on our tongue and our, and our palate, but we're also getting these amazing health benefits, um, that, you know, because it's a, it's, a, it's a whole food, if you will. All right, let's do an exam roomy roll call real quick. We haven't done this yet today. I want to say hi to Karen, who's watching in Germany. Philip, who's checking in from one of the great sports towns in the country, Indianapolis. He's watching today. Love Indianapolis, man. I got to get to an Indy 500 sometime in my day. Uh, Sabrina is watching in Tennessee. I know that we have somebody right now watching over in India. Sherry's checking in from Delaware. Of course, Tofu Tuesday, sweltering heat out in Arizona. Lee is in Lubbock, Texas. We're raising health IQs around the world and coast to coast here on the show. And uh, Dr. Loomis, let's end today by talking about what you and I are going to be doing coming up August 10th through 12th at the International Conference on Nutrition in Medicine in Washington, D.C. Man, I am excited to be on this weight loss panel with you because... As we were talking about earlier, man, salt was such a big part of my story when I was so overweight. I mean, I was on high blood pressure medication when I was 13, 14 years wow. old. The doctor put me on that because my blood pressure was 180 over 100 or wow. 110. And, and, and it like it never really budged except to go a little bit higher. It seemed every single time I was in the doctor's office. And a lot of that had to go to um, what I was eating. I mean, I was on the fast food standard American diet on steroids and right. it got me in trouble at an early age. So I'm really excited to be doing this weight loss panel with you. Um, I mean, we, we know how big of a, a, an issue salt can be, but you know, when somebody loses weight, are you coaching them beyond just, you know, watch your fat, watch your calories, but like you, you really got to get that sodium under control. That's equally as important. Is that anything you're going to be talking about here? Well, so, so it's interesting, Chuck. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited uh, to, to be on that panel as well. And I'm, I'm going to be talking specifically about diet and, and, and weight loss. But here's the thing, um, you know, high blood pressure is not a lysinopril deficiency. Type 2 diabetes is not a metformin deficiency. High cholesterol is not a, a Lipitor deficiency. Um, I would even go so far as to argue that these aren't even uh, chronic diseases these are normal physiologic responses to abnormal behaviors, right? We did not evolve as human beings sit behind a computer all day and listen and eat Krispy Kreme donuts. And, and the thing is, you know, we practice health reductionism. And what I mean by that is we treat people's blood pressure different than we treat their, their high blood, their, 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 their blood sugars, different than they treat their cholesterol, different than they treat their rate, weight, different than tr we treat their cancer risk. But if you flip it upside down, it's all the same thing. It's the food that goes in our mouth and how much we move and how much we stress and what environmental toxins like alcohol and tobacco that we expose ourselves to. And so when we flip that model upside down and really focus hard on these lifestyle related drivers of our health, we focus on food, we focus on exercise, we focus on stress management and sleep, limiting environmental toxins, then all of those conditions get better. So when I counsel patients, you know, I, you know, again, just like we practice health reductionism, we sometimes practice nutrition reductionism. You know, we've stopped talking about food. We talk about what food's made out of. We talk about salt. We talk about fiber. We talk about fat. We talk about protein. We, but, but again, when we, when we flip that upside down and talk about food and what it means to eat healthy and why eating whole foods is, is the healthiest diet on the planet, then we don't really have to worry about the rest of it. Because I guarantee if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you don't need to worry about your sodium intake. You don't need to worry about your fat intake. You don't need to worry about if I'm getting enough protein or enough fiber. So, so again, you know, when I counsel patients, it's not around specifically salt or fat or fiber. It's about food and the importance of food and how, when again, when we embrace a lifestyle that includes you know, a whole food plant-based diet and regular physical activity and getting a good night's sleep and try not to stress out and don't smoke and limit or eliminate alcohol consumption. That's how people are going to get, get on the other side of all these chronic diseases, which are so prevalent, prevalent in, in the modern world today.
No doubt about it, man. And we're going to spend two hours talking all about diet, weight loss. We're bringing uh, surgery into the conversation. We're bringing uh, all of these weight loss drugs that we've been hearing about into the conversation. Um, so many great doctors on the panel. Yourself, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Jamie Kane, who's going to be joining us on the show next week, plus Dr. Garth Davis, Dr. Hanna Kaliova, Dr. Steve Loam, Dr. Vanita Rahman. And we're just all going to get together and present this latest findings and then take your questions and, and answer it because weight loss is really one of those things that for all the talk about it i feel like we still haven't exactly mastered it as a society so our goal on that day is to give it to you from the patient perspective but then the clinical perspective so you guys can take all of that information with you and apply it to your practice or your life to really start to move the needle in terms of curving this obesity epidemic and that's just one panel over the course of these three amazing days where you're going to see so much incredible nutrition research. We've got Senator Cory Booker, who's going to be kicking everything off for us on August 10th. But then also speaking throughout the conference, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Christy Funk, our friend, Dr. Andrew Freeman, who was just on the show, uh, my co-host from One Healthy World, Dr. Gemma Newman will be there. Brenda Davis will also be there. Dr. David Katz, who's coming up on the show very soon as well. A lot of people are going to be there, and we would love it if you could be there as well. PCRM.org slash ICNM to get your tickets coming up soon, August 10th through 12th, right here in Washington, D.C. at the Grand Hyatt. Looking forward to that. But really, Dr. Loomis, greatly appreciate your time today, my friend. Thank you so very much for carving out a little bit of time in between patients and the doc and chef and everything that you've got going on, man. I know you're a busy guy, so we appreciate you making the time today. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks for having us. It's always a pleasure to be here on the exam room. And uh, I love, you know, I appreciate you for everything you're doing and spreading the word on, on, you know, making the world a healthier place. You're my guy. And don't forget, we've got links to all of the Doc and Chef stuff down below in the show description and in the episode notes. Your tickets for the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine as well, they are down below. And then if you like this video, you feel like you raised your health IQ by a point or two, go ahead and like it and subscribe to the Physicians Committee's YouTube channel or like the Facebook page as well. All of that goes to what Dr. Loomis just said, making the world a healthier place. Also want to say thank you to the crew behind the scenes for making the magic happen and you exam roomies for braving the sweltering heat and then staying up late with us over in uh, Germany and wherever it is that you're watching today. You guys make the show the incredible nutrition juggernaut that it is. But for today, that is all the time that we have. I want to say thank you again to everybody and for everyone at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We will talk to you again very, very soon. But until then, you know what to do. Keep it plant-based.